Um, is, um, is this what we're going to be doing here? We can't resurrect one of the... Okay, well, um, let's see if we can make this, <laughs> make this thing work. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm chapter 90, or Psalm 90. And again, as you've already heard this evening, we are considering the eternality of God. And we see that very uh, plainly given to us in verses 1 and 2. But I'd like to read for you the entire psalm, Psalm 90, verses 1 through 17. Now, this uh, particular psalm is unique. I believe it's the only one that Moses wrote, and it is a very powerful one. I think one that we would do well to meditate on uh, often because it does remind us of two things. It reminds us that our lives are limited, but that God's is not. And that's why we need to be looking to him as our everlasting refuge. This is what Moses writes under the inspiration of the Spirit. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood, they fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew, toward evening it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury, we have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone, and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord, how long will it be, and be sorry for your servants. O satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us, and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children, and let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. And do confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. Uh, one thing we want to see this evening is the fact that because God is, certainly he is a present help to us, uh, he is always there. He is always there to do what he has promised that he will do and to provide the blessings that he has promised to provide. But the fact that he exists forever also means that the things that he has promised with regard to those eternal blessings, uh, he is also able to give us. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, it has been said, because it is true, that God is incomprehensible. And what that means is there is no way that you or I can fully understand God. We have a finite mind, we have a limited mind, and the the finite cannot comprehend the infinite. We can't wrap our minds around God. He is simply too great. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that we can't know God. We certainly can because God has actually revealed himself to us. He has revealed himself to us that we might know him and that we might, of course, uh, be in awe of him, that we might love him, even as we've been looking at uh, the, the different reasons why we should, so that we might put our trust in him. Now, that revelation that God gives to us, of course, is not comprehensive. I do think that God has revealed to us everything that there is about him, but we'll never understand the depths of his being, again, because of our uh, limited minds. But what he has revealed to us 
is true and we can know him and we can know him, we can love him and certainly the Lord intends that we trust him. Now what is it that we do know about God? What is it that he has revealed? Well, so far in the study we've seen that he is love. He is infinite love. That is his character. And everything else about his character basically flows from that. But he, we have also seen that he is infinitely great. Those two things. Now I think you've already, you already understand that it's not difficult to love one who has infinite love. I mean, think about the people that you love. Think about uh, those of you who are married. Think about your spouses. Parents, you have children. Think about your children. You love them. And children, I hope, you love your parents as well. I think all of us have friends that we care about, that we love. Now, their love for us is only limited, and yet we love them. But how much easier then is it to love one who loves with an infinite love? How much easier is it to love God? His infinite love, especially for you in the Lord Jesus Christ, makes it quite easy to love him. Because as you know, God's love has been for you from everlasting. And as we're going to see this evening, it will be too everlasting. But now what about one who is infinitely great? One who has limitless power, infinite knowledge, and also, of course, is present everywhere at one time. Now, one like that might be more difficult to love, except that this being, the only being like this, is clothed with this infinite love. Love for you as a believer. So the fact that God has these characteristics are not so much a reason for us to fear him, although we ought to reverence and respect him, but reasons to love him more as we've already seen. Now tonight we're going to add one more of these characteristics to this list of his greatness, and that is God's eternality. The fact that God always has been and always will be. Now, the two things we're going to look at is that you should love God because he always lives. Perhaps that's the best way to put it. And secondly, because he always lives, he always has and always will love you and take care of you. So first of all, let's consider that God always lives, that he is eternal. And again, as we consider uh, this particular attribute of God, we do need to realize that in many ways it's past our understanding. But there are some things we can't understand. What does it mean that God is eternal? Well, we already know that God's uh, omnipresence has to do with his limitlessness with respect to place or space, that God is everywhere at one time, actually with his whole being, not stretched through space as it were, not diffused like a gas but rather he is present in his whole being everywhere. His omnipotence talks about his limitlessness or his infinity with respect to power. God can do whatever he wants to do. There are no limits with him. And of course, his omniscience is his infinity with respect to knowledge. God knows everything. He knows everything that has happened. He knows everything that is, everything that will be. God even knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances. He has infinite knowledge. Now, his eternality simply means that God is limitless with respect to time. Time does not affect God. Now, this is a little bit different in the, in the, um, in, in the respect that time is something, at least as, as far as we can understand it, it is something that God has created and what it means is that God is not bound by it, God is not limited by it as we are, but God dwells outside of time as well as inside of time. God is transcendent and God is imminent. That's the way that it might be put more technically. Now, first of all, let's consider that God lives outside of time. There is a sense in which time is irrelevant to God. Moses writes in our passage, um, in, in verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or as a watch in the night. And Peter writes something that's very similar to that in uh, 2 Peter 3, 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, 
that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Now, Moses and Peter don't mean by this that God doesn't know the difference between a day and a thousand years. He's very well aware of the difference. But in a certain sense, they are the same to him in that they do not affect him. They do not change him. He is not bound by time the way that we are. He is not subject to time. Now, for us, there is a great deal of difference between a day and a year, between a day and 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years because we only have so many years, at least in this life we only have so many years. We do know that um, once the Lord has made us, we will not cease to exist in that sense because he's going to uphold us throughout e eternity. We do have many years, but with regard to our lives, we only have so many years here in this world. Moses tells us in verse 8, as for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. But the same isn't true for God. He writes in verse 2, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You know, as time-bound creatures, we can only describe things in terms of time. And I was trying to wrestle with this idea, from everlasting. Well, that's, that's kind of hard to comprehend because uh, time doesn't go infinitely backwards, does it? I mean, if it is created, uh, God dwelt in eternity and at a certain point, God created time. He, he started the clock rolling and he made a, a creation that is time-bound. It doesn't go back eternally. So how do we understand this? Well, I guess we would have to understand it in this way, that if time did go back eternally, then God would be from everlasting. The fact is that time does stop at a certain point because it has a beginning, but even beyond that, can't really say before that because that's a time, that, that's a point that has to do with time or a term that has to do with time, but beyond that, God existed and God will exist as far as time will go. You know, once God created time, that time will continue and it will stretch on without end into the future. And the reason why it will is because the Lord has determined that we're going to continue to exist and we are time-bound creatures. We will never, as it were, not need time the way that God does. And so time will continue. So from as far back as time could go to as far forward as it goes, he is God. God is eternal. Uh, our brother Dick Nielsen used to put it this way, often in prayer. God has no end because he has no beginning. God always has been. He always will be. He is. As a matter of fact, one of the names by which God reveals himself to us is the, the, the word we pronounce, Yahweh. And he expounds that name to Moses and he says, I am who I am. Not that I was or I will be, but I am. He is the one who is in the eternal now, as it were, the one who doesn't change, the one who isn't affected by time. By the way, what's true of God is true of all three persons of the Godhead. And I think this is one way that we can demonstrate the divinity or the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ because the same thing is said about him, that he is eternal, by the way, all the attributes that are spoken of regarding God are true of the Lord Jesus Christ, but since we're dealing with this one, we'll just simply look at this one. In the book of Hebrews, we read that the Father says of the Son in Hebrews 1, verses 10 and 12, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will become old. They will all become old like a garment. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. Now, notice the different things that are said about Jesus here. That Jesus existed in the beginning. And that's the very start of the creation. The beginning also of time. Before time existed, Jesus was already there. At least with regard to his divinity, his deity this, as the Son of God, that he is the creator. He is the one who laid the foundation of the earth, but 
isn't it said in Scripture, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Well, Jesus, of course, is that person of the Godhead through whom the Lord created. In time, the creation will perish. The Lord is the one who is said to roll them up like a garment, that they will be changed. Well, he is the one who will do away with them, and he will continue to exist once they are done. Of course, the Lord is going to refashion them and recreate them into the new heavens and the new earth. But as time goes by, notice you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Now, it may be true that uh, we will not come to an end either because the Lord is going to uphold us. He's going to sustain us. But it's not true of us that we will be the same. We are always changing. I think it was Parmenides, wasn't it, that said that, or maybe it was Heraclitus. No, Heraclitus, you can't step into the same river twice. Everything is always changing. He was one of the Greek philosophers. Well, the fact is that as creatures, we will always be changing. We're always changing states of, of emotion. We're always changing in our understanding. We're always growing up or growing old. Something about us is always going to be changing, but that's not true of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will always be the same, and that can only be said of God. So don't be afraid to point the Jehovah's Witnesses to this particular passage to demonstrate that Jesus is, in fact, God. Now, again, this has to do with the fact that God exists outside of time. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't also exist in time. Again, he transcends it, but he is within it. God is present at this moment with us, and we are in time, as we've already seen. But again, time does not affect God as it does us. Time is a, is a creation. Time is a creature like everything else that God has made. It may be hard to define what it is. You know, it's not hard to define uh, some of the things that God has made, what a tree is or what a star is or what a person is or a chair or something like that. It is hard to define what time is. As one of my uh, seminary professors said, we, we use it all the time <laughs> and we assume that we know what it means. But we really... When we try to describe it, when we try to define it, it is a difficult thing. So I'm not going to try to do that this evening, but I'm just going to say this, that it is a creation, that it isn't eternal. And therefore, like any other creature God has made, it does not affect him, it can't change him, it can't hurt him any more than anything else God has created can. But God is present in time, even though it doesn't affect him as well as outside of time. But now here's another point that I wanted to bring out just because I think it's interesting. Because as we, as we conceive of the fact that God is eternal, sometimes we think that means that God exists in all points of time at one time. That God exists in the past and that God exists in the future as well as existing here. But I'd like to submit to you uh, this evening that God doesn't exist in the past or in the future, that God only exists in the present. He exists in eternity, outside of time, and he exists in time at this particular moment. Now again, why do I say that? Does that mean that God is limited because he doesn't exist throughout time? No, I don't think so because he doesn't exist in the past because the past doesn't exist. And he doesn't exist in the future because God hasn't yet created the future. The only time that exists is really this particular moment in time. And actually, after I said that, that ceased to exist. Now this moment exists and so forth. The only time that exists is the moment in which we are dwelling right now. And let me tell you why I think that. I don't think that the past can exist because if it did... And let's say God existed in the past with the things that have taken place in the past. Then everything that has already happened in the past would still be happening, at least for God. Even the sinful things that have happened somewhere in time. David would still be committing adultery with Bathsheba. Peter would still be denying his Lord. And sadly, you and I would still be committing the very things of which we are ashamed of today. 
these things would be just as present with God as if they were happening right now because God would be dwelling in the past with those things. He would be existing with them. But the fact is that those events are past. And when the Lord forgave us, when he removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, he remembered them no more, not in the sense that he forgot them, but he will not bring them up in judgment against us. But if the past still existed, and if our sins still existed in the past, we would still be committing those sins against God. And they would be just as offensive to God as if we were committing them for the first time because God would be there when we are committing them for the first time. I think you can see that if the past existed, then our sins would as well, and so would the offense that our sins commit. And the same thing is, is true with regard to the future. Does God exist in the future? Some people think that what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, with regard to the fact that we have been raised up with Christ and we are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that that means that we are in the future now with Christ in heaven. But that's not actually what Paul is referring to. What Paul means by that is because we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and are united to him by faith that everything that is true of him is also true of us. We might be on the earth, but we are united with him who is in heaven. And in principle, we are actually already seated with him in those heavenly places because it is so certain to take place, it will take place. And vicariously, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are in fact seated in heaven. It doesn't mean that the future exists now because if it did, that would mean that we're already in the new heavens and the new earth enjoying those blessings with God, that we've already been resurrected to life, that the second coming has already taken place, that we've already passed the final judgment, and we are with the Lord in glory. But these things really don't yet exist. They haven't existed yet because God in his plan has not brought them about. So God exists outside of time. He is not a time-bound uh, being, but he also exists in time. But the only time in which he exists is the present time because the present moment is the only moment that God has currently created and is upholding by his power. What difference does it make? Well, I think I've already given you, of course, some of the differences. We're not in heaven right now except that we're united with Christ. And we're not still committing those sins that we committed in the past. Thankfully, that's gone. But another thing is too, as much as um, you know, we, we like the idea of the possibility of time travel, you know, that's, that's probably an idea that, that's occurred to you from at least one point or another, if you've read a book about time travel, science fiction or something, or maybe seen a movie, that's something that really is impossible. You can't travel in time. I can't travel in time. Man will never be able to travel in time. And the reason why he can't is because there is no time to go to except the present. You can't go into the past if it doesn't exist. And you can't go into the future if it doesn't exist. That would be like going somewhere that doesn't exist. But you can't go nowhere. And you can't be somewhere that doesn't actually, uh, that isn't, well, that isn't in being now. So time travel's impossible. And again, we need to be thankful that those things don't exist because if they did, we would eternally be committing the sins that we had committed in the past. Thankfully, they're gone and done away with and the guilt of them has also been dealt with by our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so anyway, that I think is about as much as we can understand about the eternality of God. God exists from everlasting as far back as time goes and beyond. God will exist forever as far as time will go, both within time and outside of time. God is eternal. But let's consider now why his eternality is a reason that you should love him. And I think the reasons are, are fairly simple. The first one is because God has always existed, God has always loved you, at least if you are a believer you know that he has. 
Now again, we saw that with regard to God's infinite knowledge. God from eternity has known you. He has known you intimately. He has known what his plans were for you. He had put uh, his affections on you and he purposed to send Jesus for you and to redeem you and to have you as his child forever and ever. That is an everlasting love. That, by the way, is another thing that Dick Nielsen would often say. God's love has no end because it has no beginning. And that is absolutely true. God doesn't just you know, think of you at some point in eternity or some point in time and suddenly say, I'm going to love that person. But God has actually loved you. If he loves you now, he has loved you from all eternity. And the fact that he has also means he will never cease to love you. But again, the second point is, is simply that. I mean, he's loved you from all eternity and he will love you for all eternity. Because God lives forever, he will continue to love you and he will always be there to take care of you. You talk about the ultimate insurance program and assurance as they put it, I, I, I think in Canada. Uh, this is it, the fact that God always lives to care for you. Now again, God not only has the power to fulfill his promises to you as we've seen, but the fact that he is, will always be around means that he will always be there to continue those promises to you. Now think about this. If God was able to do what he promised now, but he wasn't able to do it forever, then you might enjoy his blessings now, but you would eventually lose them when you lost God, as it were. Now, most importantly, you might be safe now, certainly safe from hell, but one day you would simply cease to exist because your existence depends upon God's existence. One thing we haven't looked at in, uh, with regard to God is the fact that he alone is independent. He alone does not depend on anything else for his existence, uh, for his happiness, for anything that he needs. God is in and of himself all that he needs. But that is not true of you or me. We do not exist in and of ourselves. We depend upon God. And if God ceased to exist, you would cease to exist as well because he is the only thing that keeps you in existence. But the good news here is that, that God is not going to cease to exist. God lives forever. The same infinite power and wisdom that brought you into existence and that infinite love that has loved you from all eternity will always be there to uphold you, to keep you, and to care for you. So you, you don't need to be afraid, ultimately. In this life, the Lord is never going to fail you. The Lord is always going to be there for you. And you don't need to be afraid when this world is over. When the Lord has brought you safely through the judgment. When he's brought you into the new creation. When thousands of years have passed or millions of years have gone by. God is not going to run out of power. God is not going to cease to be. And because he isn't, you and all things are not going to disappear. You are going to live on forever. From everlasting to everlasting, Moses tells us, he is God. So he will always live to care for you. So basically, we've seen several things about God. We've seen that he's omnipresent. Thankfully, he's everywhere and always near to help you. God is not a God who is far off, but he is a God who is near God is omnipotent. He has unlimited power to do everything that he has promised you. He is omniscient, and thankfully that means for us that God, when he saved us, when he set his affection on us, actually that love that has been forever, God has known everything that we were going to do. From the very beginning of our lives to the very end of our lives, he even knew every sin that we would commit after, we, uh, after he saved us, and it's not going to take him by surprise. He's not going to cast us away. Knowing all those things, he still chose to save us. So again, 
omniscience even, is a blessing. And God is eternal. He never began to be, and he will never cease to be, which means that the love that he had for you at the beginning will never end. He will be there forever for you by his grace to keep you and to provide for you. Now again, can you love a God like this? And do you love him? And would you rather that he be other than what he is? I mean, would you rather that God be a temporary God? Uh, one that will some way, someday will die and cease to exist? Because you realize when he ceases to exist, you would cease to exist as well. I don't think you would want a God like that. I wouldn't want a God like that. This is a perfection in God and one that makes him to be even more desirable, even more lovely, even more beautiful. God is perfect. But let me just say a word to those of you here this evening who may not have put your trust in the Lord. The same thing would not be true regarding you if you never put your trust in him. There actually will come a time when you wish that this would be the case because you need to realize that though etern eternality, God's, uh, the fact that he lives forever may be a blessing for those who actually know him and love him. Eternality is a threat to you who don't know him because it means that he always lives to make sure that the wicked will be justly punished. That the fires of hell, which are basically the fires of God's wrath, will never go out. They will always be. If you're not a believer, you would rather that God would go out of existence so that his punishment might actually end even if it meant that you too would cease to exist because it would be better not to exist than to enter into hell and be punished forever. But you see, that would never happen if God lives forever. The Bible says that all those who enter into hell will never leave hell because God never ceases to be. You know, it was said of Judas, it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Well, if Judas were to cease to exist, then he would be the same as if he never had been born, right? But the fact that it, was, it would have been good for him if he had never been born meant that what was ahead of Judas was much worse than the simple ending of his existence. Judas was going to enter into the eternal flames, and he would never be able to escape. But what is true of Judas is true of everyone who does not trust in the Lord. Because God lives forever, the fires of hell will never go out. But the good news is that you don't have to be afraid of, of God's eternality if you will turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. Because this eternal God, as we've already seen, is infinitely gracious and he has provided a way for you to escape. He has given you his son, the Lord Jesus Christ as a savior one who is willing to take away all of your sins, one who is willing to give you his perfect righteousness, his perfect obedience. All you have to do is turn from your sins and trust in the Lord because then the eternal God will give you something that is infinitely better. He will give to you eternal life instead of eternal death. He will give you a life that is perfect as well as one that will have no end. And you know, the, the most wonderful thing is he will show you a love that is infinite, one that is as limitless as his existence, but you have to turn from your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to, by his grace, begin to live the kind of life that he calls you to live. I mean, what he's asking you to do is to turn away from hating him and others and begin to love him and others and trust in his son so that you might and that you might have your sins forgiven. So eternality is a blessing to those who love him, but it is a curse to those who do not. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and trust him and you will live Eternality will be a blessing to you. 
Well, may the Lord grant you the grace that you need to be able to do that. Let's, um, let's bow for a, a moment of prayer. And let's again ask the Lord to apply his word to us individually as we need to hear it.